In this third and final component for week three, we're going to take a look at what we've learned about adulteration from the FDA side and compare it to what we see the Food Safety Inspection Service of the USDA define and enforce their term of adulteration, remembering that we're coming from two different enabling statutes when we talk about the USDA, and we're not under the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act. So we'll see how we define adulteration for meat products and how we enforce those uh, as well and how that compares. So it's first important to remember that when we're talking about meat products, when we're talking about the Food Safety Inspection Service, that the term adulteration is going to apply to a broad range of activities and a broad range of products that they're working on. We're talking about both the slaughtering and the processing of meat products. So the, uh, FSIS conducts both post-mortem and anti-mortem slaughter inspections. The term adulteration is going to apply broadly to all of those activities. The FSIS also looks at the production of meat once it leaves the slaughterhouse and goes into production. So any of the meat or meat food products are going to also fall into this criteria of when we look at is it adulterated or not. It's a wide range of activities and products that we're looking at and so this definition of adulteration applies in probably a wider circumstance than you may see with the FDA. Now right away when we look at the definition of adulteration in section 601M we're going to see a lot of similarities to what we saw with the uh, Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act's definition of adulteration. Remember when we talked about the history and we read about the history of the FDA and the USDA, the Pure Food and Drug Act, the Fe Federal Meat Inspection Act were passed on the same day in 1906. They came through the same process, the same committees, so it's not surprising that we see similar language in a similar process. So just as the FDA definition of adulteration is incredibly broad and incredibly complex, so is the meat side. And we see that there are nine parts to this definition of adulteration. And we'll just focus on one part for our purposes uh, for this lecture. And we're going to focus on that part that seems very familiar to the, the component that we talked about previously. And that is the standard of poisonous or deleterious substance which may be injurious to health. And we're looking again at this distinction about ordinarily injurious may render injurious as well. So all of that is going to be very familiar to what we're talking about today. What we then have to do is think about the difference, again, defining that food product. What is the difference between an FDA food and a USDA FSIS regulated meat product? And, and it's because of that, how are these risks of what could be considered an adulterant different? So something to keep in mind as, as we talk today. And again, one of the first things we do, we, we define adulteration, and then we get this, this bifurcation of added versus non-added. And so it's really important when we talk about the USDA that we're talking really not only about added versus non-added, but we're talking about raw meat versus other meat products. And one of the categories that we have within the uh, FSIS scheme is what's called ready-to-eat products, RTEs. And you're looking at an RTE in the photo here, uh, some roast beef, I think, from the photo. Deli meats, a few other categories like that. Deli meats is the one that's probably easiest to visualize, are RTEs. They don't require any additional processing for the consumer to go and, and buy and then consume. So, you know, deli meats, we buy them, we put them in our sandwich, and we consume them. And so it's important when we're talking about adulteration, what's going to be deemed adulteration on something like a ready-to-eat product versus what's going to be considered adulteration on a raw meat product. Raw meat products, the expectation is that the product will be cooked and there's a responsibility for the consumer or the restaurant or whoever is preparing it to bring it to the appropriate temperature to uh, re kill those pathogens that could be present. Now, if there are other adulterants, say metal fragments, then of course the cooking step is going to take care of that and that's an added adulterant that we can look at. But for this distinction of non-added, remember we're talking largely about naturally occurring components or uh, attributes to these products and pathogens are a naturally occurring component to meat products. 
salmonella, E. coli, and some of these others that we're going to talk about. But when we're talking about raw meat, for the most part, these pathogens aren't going to be considered a, an adulterant because they're naturally occurring, and there's going to be this expectation that the consumer will take steps that would eliminate the pathogen. But the USDA uh, FSIS is very careful to give two examples of what it means to be an added adulterant in particular for RTE products. Now, these two that I've listed are naturally occurring. They're in the animal. We would expect them to some extent to be there. But the FSIS has said that for listeria, that scientific studies have shown that the uh, pathogen is present in a product due to the way that it is handled or produced. And they give an example where there's a recontamination through contact with the environment. And if they're not, if the product is not reheated, then we've taken this listeria from somewhere that within the, the facility and we've introduced it back to this product. And an example of an RTE, we don't expect the consumer to reheat it. So then we've taken something that's naturally occurring and we've tried to reduce and keep out of the, uh, the production. And now we've added it, we've reintroduced it into this RTE. And the same for E. coli, the USDA is careful in saying that, you know, for the most part, we see that E. coli is spread from the hide or digestive tract of the animals during slaughter and processing. And so it's injurious to health because many of the normal ways for cooking the products, we may expect not to, to kill it. And for example, if we're talking about beef, like steak, for example, and there's this expectation that someone may order or prepare it for themselves rare, then we can say that by introducing this E. coli, that the expectation of the consumer is they may not take steps that would eliminate it. So it's a little more of a complicated discussion to have when we're talking about added versus non-added because we have to talk about this discussion of raw and how the consumer will cook that raw meat product. And then we have to talk about this group of products that uh, like RTEs that were not going to maybe be heated up or uh, cooked and therefore reduce the, path, the pathogen that could contaminate it. A multi-layered discussion that we can have there, but it gives you a sense of what it means to be added, what it means to be naturally occurring, and when naturally occurring can then take that, that change, that transition to become added again. So the Poultry Products Inspection Act came later than the Federal Meat Inspection Act. But at that point, we had two acts, the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act that used this poisonous and deleterious standard, the may render standard, ordinarily injurious standard, and so forth. So it made sense that when we're talking about the poultry products that we're going to use the same definition of adulteration. We're not going to create a brand new one just for poultry products. It, it didn't make sense. And so a lot of what we know and take examples from in the Federal Meat Inspection Act applies to poultry products. And again, using that paradigm of how poultry products are consumed to understand whether or not it's an, an added adulterant, a non-added adulterant, or when that naturally occurring adulterant, such as a pathogen, could end up being reintroduced or re-added like we saw on the previous slide. So for the most part, we're talking about the same thing when we're talking poultry products and meat products. We're just citing a different statutory section than we, than we do for uh, what we're talking about. Now for the, the most part, when we're talking about FSIS and we're talking about poultry, we're really talking about seven pathogens that are, that are considered adulterants. And they're all strains of E. coli. We just don't expect E. coli largely to be in the poultry products, but we do expect salmonella. But we don't have salmonella introduced as an adulterant because we talked about this in Supreme Beef at the very surface level. When the FSI has tried to introduce this new rule to control salmonella in the plant, the, there was this discussion on the court saying that this wouldn't be injurious to the health of the consumer because there's an expectation that if there is salmonella present, that the, there's not going to be raw chicken consume the chicken you know I really can't think of a circumstance where chicken is eaten uh, rare or raw so the court said you know this is going to be something that will be taken through a process that will eliminate that risk 
But we have to ask ourselves, is this necessarily the case? And we, and we have this recent example at the end of 2013 into 2014 of this uh, outbreak of illnesses of salmonella poisoning involving foster farms. And we have to think about this in terms of when does a strain of salmonella become an issue to the point that we would say it's an adulterant. And, and what do we do in situations where we have something that is causing an outbreak? We know that the product is responsible for the illness, but it's not an adulterant. We can't go back and recreate a rule, and we can't go back and, and change what we're talking about versus added and non-added at that time. And, and so all of our enforcement tools suddenly become more or less useless because in order for this enforcement action to begin as a compulsion from the agency, we have to say, look, you have an adulterated product. Because the product's adulterated, we can seize it. We can um, you know, go to court and ask for a recall. We can take these steps. But when we don't have that legal leverage to say this is an adulterant, what do we do? And so this is something that we're confronting now with the foster farms outbreak. And it's an interesting question, and there's, I'm certain going to be following this, a very long discussion about how salmonella can be an adulterant and be added to this list. Because right now, for poultry products, we're really looking at E. coli strains. And so, again, not an easy process that we go through, and it's not always a precise process. Uh, and the last thing I'll say on the USDA side is that we also get into economic adulteration, something that we've spent the second component of this week talking about, but we don't see as many cases of that on the USDA side. It's just not as an active area of legislation and enforcement. What will be interesting to see happen as we go forward with the Food Safety Modernization Act is if the FDA is raising the bar to come up and introduce this idea that we will continue actively looking and enforcing economic adulteration we mentioned this in the second component. And we have the USDA FSIS that is operating under two enabling statutes that are not been modernized, have not gone through this process, and they're not on par with what the FDA is doing. What, it, what does that disparity cause, and do we need both agencies to be on the same page when we come to adulteration? We see that both agencies are operating from the same, uh, nearly identical, definitions in most cases of adulteration. So what does it mean when we have one agency that's rising to a new level of enforcement and another agency is not? It can be an interesting question along with the salmonella question of how economic adulteration under the USDA continues to be relevant. So hopefully we've covered uh, all of your questions on this topic and we'll move in next week to discuss misbranding.